Hey, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about India and Southeast Asia. Our series this week will focus on the first empires in India, as well as in Southeast Asia. We'll also be talking about religions that develop, including Buddhism and Hinduism. Guest starring tonight is Lily, whose tail is wagging now as she's excited because she thinks she might be getting more attention, as always. So our key concepts, take a look. We're talking about Sanskrit, Buddhism and Hinduism, new types of literature and drama, the rise of the Maurya and the Gupta, new types of government systems, and more functions to the cities. Take a look at our timeline, especially note 1500 BCE, migration of the Indo-European people. That does matter. We'll talk about why in just a moment. All right, foundations of Indian civilization. Now, this is actually an ancient holy text in India that is still used today. It is an excerpt from the Rig Veda. And let's talk about India's geography for a minute. Agriculture improved with the use of iron tools, and because of this, population and trade increased. The vast differences in the geography do make any kind of long-term government or political unity very, very different, because you have the northern mountains, you have the basins, and then you have the peninsula region. Now, the peninsula, however, is going to be incredibly convenient for Indian Ocean trade, and northern India is located um, along the Silk Road. Monsoons, which are seasonal winds and rains, allow sailors to travel around the peninsula um, on the Indian Ocean trading routes. It'll be very important when we dive into trade. All right, so let's talk about the Vedic Age. After 1000 BCE, the Vedic peoples began to settle down to agriculture. And by 500 BCE, coins were appearing in India, which is about the same time they were appearing in China and Persia. After the fall of the Indus Valley Civilization, the IRV, around 1900 BCE, uh, warriors began migrating into India anywhere from 19 to 1500. And this is going to play a very large role um, in society because... The oral tradition of the light-skinned Aryan tribes tells of a very violent struggle between themselves and the darker-skinned native Dravidians, and they would push them into southern India. And the struggle between the Aryas and the, uh, the Dasas, or the Dravidian-speaking people, leads to a system, um, a class system called Varna, which literally means color, but is equivalent to the world class. And under this system, people were born into one of four Varna, which you've got the Brahmin, who are the priests and the scholars. You've got the warriors, the merchants, and the Shudra, which are the peasants and the laborers. And a fifth class was the untouchables. They're outside the system, and they're considered unclean because the work they do is ritually polluting to the spirit. The four Vina, Varna are divided into hereditary occupational groups called the Jati, but the most common word that everyone knows is actually not even an Indian word. It's a Portuguese word called caste. So you've probably heard of the caste system. And Jati were arranged in a hierarchy. Um, there were certain rules and regulations, and these were very, very complex rules that governed appropriate occupation, duties, and rituals. But it also laid out very strict regulations concerning interaction between people of a different jati. Oh, can't have that. And we're back. Moving on to a slide two of the Vedic Age. The Vedic faith changed, moving from external rituals to internal rituals to morality. And the systems of the Varna and the Jati were rationalized by belief in reincarnation. And according to this, each individual has an immortal spirit called the Atman. That means once you die, you are reborn into another body. And the station in life depends on one's actions in this and previous lives, aka your karma. Holy texts in the Upanishads, which were composed between 900 BCE and 600 BCE, introduced the idea of the transmigration of the soul. And the Vedic religion emphasized the worship of male deities through sacrifice, which was done only by the Brahmins because they were the only ones who actually knew these rituals and the prayers and the hymns. 
And they're probably also the ones who actually um, oppose the introduction of writing because this way they have a monopoly, not just on writing, but then also reading. And they could maintain their monopoly also on religious knowledge. Now, we don't know a whole lot, whole lot about the status or roles of women in the Vedic age. Um, they could own land. They married in their middle or late teens. And they were actually allowed to study lore and participate in rituals. And I want you to remember that because that's going to change later on. Speaking of changes, challenges to the old order. Jainism. During the Vedic period, people reacted against the very strict hierarchy and against the, the Brahmin's religious monopoly. And they would actually withdraw into the forest and pursued salvation through yoga, special diets, and meditation. And the goal was to achieve what's called moksha. And that's liberation from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And the idea of these can be found in the Upshanads. Jainism was founded in um, about 500. The exact year is unknown, but it was founded by Mahavriya, between, uh, who lived between 540 and 468 BCE. And Jains emphasized no harm to any other living being. And they believed in right faith, knowledge, and good conduct. Some people who practiced Jainism went to such extreme measures in their attempts to not kill any living thing. They actually starved themselves to death. Um, and the ones who were extremely devoted actually wore masks over their mouth so they wouldn't accidentally inhale an insect and kill it. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've accidentally inhaled mosquitoes. There was a bee one time. That was kind of scary. Um, but aside from being a little horrifying and gross for me, to somebody who practices extreme Jainism, that was the worst thing they could do. The less extreme, however, devoted themselves to commerce and banking, basically occupations that, unlike agriculture, don't require one to kill because if you're a farmer... You're either killing animals for food or you're killing living plants for food. Buddhism. Buddhism was founded by Siddhartha Gautama, a.k.a. the Buddha, which means the enlightened one. And the Buddha was actually uh, born into the warrior class. And Siddhartha Gautama felt very alienated by his very wealthy youth and his great life. And for six years, he, uh, he practiced meditation. Uh, he lived the life of a hermit. He went on, um, on fast to the point where he almost actually died. And he still found that life was full of suffering. Um, and he actually um, was born in Nepal along the southern edge of the Himalayas. And legend says his mother dreamed of a white elephant holding a lotus flower. And Sears interpreted the dream to mean her son would either be a great monarch or a great teacher. Now, the Buddha grew up, married, and fathered a child. But then he had four encounters. Um, he noticed an elderly man, a man with a fever, um, a glimpse of a corpse, and then a fourth encounter with a wandering ascetic wearing a simple robe. And after six years of wandering, he began uh, to focus on what life was really about, the simple things. And the Buddha then set forth to teach the four noble truths and the eightfold path that would lead individuals to enlightenment. And some of his followers took vows of celibacy, nonviolence, and poverty, but it was not required. The original form of Buddhism centers on the individual's attempt to gain enlightenment through moderate living, self-discipline, and meditation. And the goal is to achieve nirvana, which is release from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So very similar to moksha. But what's very important is that when the religion of Hinduism develops in the early phases, women could not actually achieve moksha, only men could. In Buddhism, Anyone can achieve nirvana once they become enlightened. After Buddha's death, the religion began to change um, into two major schools, Mahayana and Theravada. And after he died, some of his followers organized themselves into monasteries and nunneries and developed a very complex religion, complete with the worship of the Buddha, 
reverence for the bodhisattvas who are basically enlightened people who, instead of choosing nirvana, choose to remain on earth and help others achieve. And Mahayana incorporated these new beliefs, especially worship of the Buddha and reverence to the bodhisattvas. Theravada, the originata, as I like to call it, followed the original teachings of Buddhism. And over time, Buddhism evolves in new regions that it went to. So in Japan, Zen Buddhism really focuses on the power of meditation. The teachings of the Buddha. Tradition holds that his first sermon was in Deer Park near the Ganges Valley. And his first five followers were also seeking enlightenment. And they identified two incorrect routes to enlightenment, which one was self-mortification. The other was extreme self-indulgence. The Noble Eightfold Path is a means to escape the endless cycle of rebirth and achieve nirvana. And he also analyzed the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. Suffering comes from desire. Solution to suffering lies in curbing your desire, which can be cured by following the Eightfold Path, focusing on meditation, mindfulness of actions, livelihood, conduct, speech, aspirations, and proper views of life. Follow the Eightfold Path that will lead to nirvana, the end of the cycle of rebirth. So moksha versus nirvana. Moksha is in Jainism and Hinduism. Um, you can pause this and look over it if you want. It seems to have cut off again. I don't understand, but that's fine. So, in short, moksha refers to liberation from the cycles of births and death as human life is believed to be one of full of pains and sufferings. However, nirvana is believed to be a state of mind that is attained when one reaches enlightenment. It is a state of mind when human emotions become stable and the feelings or emotions get dissolved. All right. So let's talk about Hinduism. Now, there's a lot of pressure um, on the Vedic faith because many people were leaving to join religious movements, especially Buddhism, and that's really going to lead to a reform of the old Vedic faith. As a result... Um, what the priests start doing is incorporating personal religious devotion, fertility rituals, and then some symbols and gods of the Dravidian culture, as well as some elements of Buddhism. Sacrifice becomes less important with the role of personal devotion to gods increasing. And this was actually attracting um, many of the Dravidians and the Buddhists back into the Vedic faith. And as part of the reform, Two minor Vedic deities took the places of honor in Hinduism, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. Hindu worship focused um, quite a bit on various gods and goddesses. Um, each god or goddess has a very interesting background story, and they also have a counterpart of the opposite gender. Hindu worship took place in temples and shrines and included service to a deity, clothing it, cleaning it, feeding it. And the Ganges River also, the Ganges River became one of the most popular pilgrimage sites. The transformation of the Vedic religion to Hinduism was so successful that it became the dominant religion in India. Hinduism appealed to the common people's need for personal deities with whom they could have a direct connection. And the issue with Theravada Buddhism, it was too it was too austere to have a popular appeal. It it didn't draw people in, it didn't form that common bond. It was very strict. And Mahayana Buddhism was so was so similar to Hinduism that the beliefs could easily be absorbed by the larger, more popular Hinduism. And at one point, there is even a legend that the Buddha is a human incarnation of Vishnu, which is how they attracted more Buddhist followers. All right. So when we talk on our next uh, next podcast, we'll be talking about the Mauryan Empire and the Gupta Empire. So have a great night and don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Cheers, y'all.